So what do you love most about this place, the North Shore? Oh, I just, I love the North Shore for its, uh, uh, well, for the surf and uh, the beaches. Uh, you, you know, in the summertime, when there's, now that I'm not surfing, uh, the summer, I almost like the summers better because in the summer it's just glassy and it's nice and uh, good for swimming and there's nobody on the beach. I, I, I'll i take Max for a walk and I'll be the only one on the beach in the morning. And it's in the winter it's a big scene because of all the surfing and the rocky point. And, but uh, it had the best surf in the world as far as I'm concerned and uh, it's got... A lot of, I like all the people that live out here. We're all kind of transients from the mainland, surfers, old surfers. And, and a lot of my best friends live out here. And so it's a nice community. And uh, <clears throat> yeah. and it's been just a fun, fun uh, place to live. It's not big like Honolulu. So it's nice to be out in the country and away from Honolulu. Not too long ago, I was talking to Walter Hoffman, and he was telling me about the first time he drove out to Makaha um, when he was out here stationed in the Navy in town, and how memorable that first encounter was. Tell me about the first encounter with the North Shore. What was your reaction, your feelings? Well, the first encounter that we had on the North Shore was actually at Alihi Beach uh, when I was... Uh, when I came, I came in August, uh, late August to start Punahou. We had the introductions to the teachers, and then we had the tours, and uh, uh, that was a kind of a humorous thing because uh, uh, we were the teachers were all going around, and, and we had, I think, uh, Mickey Bowers, this uh, mother was kind of taking us around and showing us all these places and talking about this and that, and. I took a beeline to the car, you know, to get away from this tour, and I ran into Curtis, who was the principal, and he says, where are you going, young man? I said, oh, I'm looking for a restroom. Do you know where a restroom is or something? And, and then I circled around and went back into the, to the line with the rest of the teachers. And, and uh, uh, so that was my introduction to Punahou. But in, uh, we went out, I think, uh, went out with Chubby Mitchell, uh, George Montgomery, a whole bunch of guys that I knew at, at, when I was at Stanford, they were at Santa Clara and San Jose State, and then we'd all go down to Santa Cruz. So I knew all those guys from there, Charlie Kahui. So we, uh, Chubby Mitchell and Courtesy Akea and myself and, and maybe Kimo, uh, we all went out to the country because they were having a big luau thing. Henry Priest was having a luau, and that was my introduction to the North Shore. I had never been on the North Shore. There wasn't much surf, but uh, we had a great time. It was slack key music and playing Hawaiian music and everything, and people were drinking. I was drinking this swipe, and uh, I didn't realize that when I uh, started uh, drinking it, it was so good, you know, it had that pineapple taste and everything and all of a sudden my whole lower jaw got numb and then I got numb and and the next morning it looked like Sherman's troops had gone through the south there were bodies lying on the rocks and all over I mean it was just a scene and a half but that was my introduction to the North Shore my first surf session was with Ricky we came out to sunset and in the morning it was about four to six feet and we were on the point surfing and then it got bigger and bigger. And you know how it gets real fast, big real fast here? And all of a sudden it was 8 to 10 and we were getting caught inside and then we were moving out to the lineup. And and by the end of the day it was ten, a solid 10 foot and that was our introduction. And we were totally unmanned. We had horrible boards. We had boards that would spin out at Malibu and at sunset they were just uh, total uh, not not handling the wave. In fact, uh, when it got good uh, a couple of weeks later, uh, I took 19 swims and Ricky took 17 swims. And I think we had the record for number of swims because our boards kept spinning out every time we took off. So. But that was, uh, that was it. When did you ride your first 20 plus wave and where was that? Oh, probably Waimea. Uh, 
probably probably a YM Air. Well, I think I probably had close to that a Steamer Lane in California. Uh, we 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 would get it, it could get pretty big at Steamer Lane, really pretty large. And I surfed a big day at Tijuana Sloughs. We had a big overhead, which is in Ventura. So I I think I'd had surf that was that was Hawaii Hawaii uh, size, maybe uh, 18 feet, 15 to 18 feet. Uh, probably my first 20 foot wave would be at at uh, Waimea. So would you say that you were comfortable? Going right into big waves and hook to. Oh yeah, because I'd been surfing. I I I would be being tall and kind of awkward. I was never good in small waves, so I always liked bigger waves, and uh, I always felt comfortable in the bigger waves. And never, in all the times I surfed, I never have had a, what I call a big, a bad wipeout. So uh, uh, people talk about all these wipeouts, and they see their bodies and. They, the rocks are moving underneath, and you know they they have all these stories about how they 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 almost drown and everything. And I never had a bad situation uh, because uh, whenever I'd get a wipeout, I just it, you're only down 30 seconds, 40 seconds, and the guy can hold his at the longest, and that's a two-wave hold down. So uh, I figure all you do is relax. Just say this is nice down here, you know, and all that, and and, and so I, I don't know why anybody. I can't understand how anybody can drown surfing if they're just relaxed, you know. But I, I don't know what happened. I, well, with the leash, the leash is the worst thing that ever happened to surfing because it, first of all, it causes the crowd, it causes the quantity surfers, and it just uh, and people don't swim. So they just get every other wave, and uh, and then the leash gets stuck on a bottom rock. That's what happened to Mark Fu at Mavericks. Uh, so I think we've had more deaths and more problems with with injuries after the leash than we ever did before. So, tell me. Let's go a little further back. Tell me about what brought you to Hawaii. I got a, a contract to teach at Punahou. Uh, I went on, uh, when I was teaching at San Lorenzo Valley High School, which is in Felton, right above Santa Cruz, uh, and I enjoyed the job. I, I was the head of the math department because I was the only math teacher. It was a small school, but I could teach what I wanted, and, uh, and it was really f a good job. So I was happy, and I had I, my best favorite spot surfing was Steamer Lane, and so I just was real happy, and then all of a sudden, uh, Fox had a, I had an interview with Fox up in San Francisco at the Sir Francis Drake Hotel in the lobby, and I had this interview, and he said, well, do you want to teach at Punahou? And I said, well, I'll think about it. And he said, well, you have to say yes or no now. And then I started thinking about Buzzy and Walder and all these guys getting this good surf over in the big I in the islands, and I said yes. So the following September, I came over to teach at Punahou. And uh, once I came here I, and surfed Sunset, I never went back. Describe the atmosphere, because I know that um, when you got here, many of your friends, some of your friends were here. Um, Ricky Gregg had said that everyone came at different times, but in a sense, they were always following each other's dreams. So what was that atmosphere like in the North Shore in the 50s when you arrived? Oh, it was nice. It was a small group, and uh, we had a uh, Bob Shepard and Raymond Beatty were here before I, I came. They they moved over here a couple of years before. Jose was over here. Uh, Warren Harlow was over here. Fred was over here, uh, <coughs> and these were people I knew from the mainland. And uh, so there was a group that were here before I came, and Ricky and I came. At the same time, he came to take a, to get a master's at UH in bio, in marine biology, and I came to teach at Punahou. So we were both here in the fall of '58, uh, and it was a smaller group. Uh, they they talk about uh, it was the Howleys that started the surfing on the North Shore, but actually, uh, I think Henry Priest and 
and George Downing and, and Wally, and, and uh, they, they, they came out to the North Shore quite a bit before any Hollies did. And I'm sure that, but they didn't surf Sunset much. It was mainly the places they liked were Alihi, you know, Haleiwa and Laniakea. Uh, they really liked Laniakea. It was sort of a w long wall. So, but we had a good group. It was a fun group, and we had a lot of camaraderie over the years, and, and a lot of them are still here. One of the things Buzzy said about big wave riders was that some of them weren't even that good of a swimmer, but one common denominator was they belonged in big water. I know that your connection to the water goes beyond surfing because you are a swimmer and a body surfer. Tell me about that. Well, bef when, when I was in college and when I was younger, uh, swimming was much bigger f in my life than surfing. Uh, competing in swimming was, was what I was really uh, focused on. And, uh, uh, and I, I did well. I, when I was at Stanford, I placed high in the NC2As. Uh, I got a third, two fourths, a fifth, and a sixth over the three year periods. We only had three years of eligibility, but in the NC2As, that's pretty good. And on the coast, in California area, I was the top swimmer. And the only ones that would beat me was Fort Kona over here in Hawaii and uh, the, the Yaleys. There were three Yaleys that used to beat me pretty consistently. But other than that, I was, I was on top of it all. And so I was, took swimming very seriously. But then when uh, my eligibility ran out, my senior, my senior year, I didn't have eligibility. Uh, so uh, that senior year, I started surfing Santa Cruz a lot. And I had a whole bunch of guys at Stanford that I could talk into surfing because they had cars and I didn't. And we'd drive down on weekends and we had such a good time and I got a lot of surfing then. And that's when I started, after I got out of college and out of competitive swimming in college, I sort of, surfing became my, my number one thing. And uh, when I came to Hawaii, it was mainly surfing. Was surfing everything in your life? Oh, no, no. It's, uh, to me, uh, the people that, that, that if surfing is all you have in your life, you don't have a long, you're not going to surf for a very long time because you're going to be, you're going to be uh, burned out, you know, you're going to be tired of it. And the people that stayed with it the longest were probably Ricky and I, and we both had professions that we liked. We liked our work. We, we were challenged by our work, and uh, we looked forward to our work, and we also looked at surfing more as a recreation than as a, as a total life style and everything. And that kept us at it for a longer time than a lot of these people that were burned out, you know. Greg burned out. Uh, uh, people that just, all they did was surf, they came over here, that you'd see them, they'd be here for four or five winters and then you wouldn't see them anymore. So uh, I, I think, uh, and family, you bring the biggest thing you, in your life is bring is getting married to a good woman and bringing up children, and watching your children grow and seeing them do things, and then your grandchildren. I think there's a lot of things that are much more important than just the surfing. Surfing is a recreation to me, and uh, okay, El Nino graced to what you this year, and Eddie went. Was this the day of days at the Bay? You know, uh, the Waimea, uh, Waimea uh, the big day they had the Eddie was big, but it was, uh, I've seen it a lot bigger uh, and cleaner and better, a better situation. Uh, the bigger sets were were ledgy and closing out. That's why you saw so many wipeouts. Uh, they were, and uh, uh, the guys, it was good surf. And it was, the thing that was good about it was the interval was relatively short. And the thing that was good about it was consistent. So they had a lot of waves. And uh, they'd go out and they'd get a whole bunch of waves, a whole bunch of wipeouts. So it was an exciting contest. But uh, uh, it wasn't, 
ultra big. I mean, it wasn't what I would call, maybe it was 20 at the max. Um, so it wasn't, in my opinion, the biggest day I'd ever seen, but it was, it was a entertaining. Uh, I watched it on TV. I wouldn't want to fight the crowd. So this 1250 or 250 channel, the surf channel, I love to just watch the contests on there and the pipeline and the, and the YMA and have a beer and not have any people around me and no flies buzzing around my head and, and uh, thousands of people and just th that to me is the uh, uh, ultimate is to watch it on TV and you get better, you see it, it's much better, you see, be see it better and it's, it's all a lot better deal. And so that's what I saw it up from I saw it on TV, so maybe i would not getting a proper perspective. Maybe if I was there, I could have compared it to some of the days that I remember. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah, what's happened at YMA, and a lot of people don't realize this, is in 1956, I think this is interesting, in 1956, they dredged the sand out of Waimea Bay to build the Ala Moana Shopping Center and Dillingham, the dredging company, uh, Buzzy worked for them. Um, they, uh, they dredged all the sand out of the middle so that before that, if you look at the old pictures of Waimea, you'll see the diving rock. There's sand that extends out about 200 yards past that. It's, there's no water near the diving rock. And the waves used to come in and close, and sh it, the outside break when it got big was a shore break. It wasn't it wasn't really rideable. The people say that they didn't ride YMA up until a certain point. Well, the reason was because it was just a top to bottom shore break almost outside in the regular lineup. And it didn't have, it didn't hold, it didn't allow you to ride. Well, when they dug out all that sand, it made the, it caused a channel in the middle. And so it made it so that you could ride it. So in 57, it was rideable, and that's when they started to ride it. Uh, and uh, now, over the years, the sand is coming back in. So it's more ledgy now, and it closes out on smaller waves. Uh, in, they talk about closeouts. Well, those closeouts when in the f late 50s and 60s, when you had a closeout, it was top to bottom across the whole bay, and it was 40, 50 feet. Now it closes out at 20, 25 feet because the sand has come back into the middle. So I don't think YMA is as good as it used to be, uh, simply because the sand is filled in. It's harder to get out. People have a harder time getting out in the shore break. They have a harder get time getting in, uh, and the waves, uh, when they get a certain size, they they close out, so you have waves meeting in the middle more than you... I mean, I saw waves in that TV where they were meeting in the middle and they were talking about a closeout and all that stuff, and it was nothing like what we used to see as a closeout. So uh, I think YMA is kind of history. I think it's going back to what it was before, and probably in 20 years it's going to be like it was with the diving rock on sand and... Uh, it's going to be like it was. We'll have to dredge it out and build another shopping center, I guess. <laughs> Were you there in 1957, that infamous day when Waimea? No, no, no. That was the year before we got there. I don't think they really wrote it that well. They didn't have good boards. Uh, Pat Curran told me that it was just ridiculous. They had these horrible boards. They had the wide board, tail boards, and they were spinning out, and... Uh, uh, so they, they, I don't think any, they didn't make any waves and, uh, when there was size. And uh, so Pat went back and he started, sha and he shaped himself a gun. And uh, he was a smart guy and he built this gun that was really a good board. He, he was, he and Joe Quigg built some guns and George built some guns too. They built the hot curl board, and they had the boards from for Makaha, but for Waimea, uh, Pat had the right idea, and so when he came back over in '58, uh, which is when Ricky and I came over, I got a Joe Quig that was perfect, was a good board. Uh, uh, Ricky got a Pat Curran board, and Pat made a board, and 
we started having good boards, and that made a big difference. So I'd say YMA is really being written fairly well in the in the fall of '58 and the winter of '50, you know, in the winter of '59, and from there on out, it was much different than that first year. But that first year was. If you look at the old footage of that first year, you you never saw a guy make a way. They were just spinning out, and it, and it wasn't that big. It was maybe 15 to 18. So. You, you mentioned Joe Quigg. Tell me a little bit more about Joe Quigg and his influence in the shaping of the gun. Oh, Joe Quigg was a classic craftsman, and, and he's a classic guy. I mean, he's, he's, uh, he's one of the few Santa Monica guys. I think if you go back and all the Santa Monica surfers that I grew up with, they're all gone except for Joe and myself. I think we're the only two that are still alive. And uh, Joe has got to be 90, 91 or 92. He's, and, uh, but he's still shaping uh, boats and building boats and things. And, but he, he uh, was a real craftsman. And he, I think he was influenced by uh, George and uh, Wally on, on what was good for Makaha, you know, and he built a gun. It was, I think Buzzy called it the singing sword or something, and it was a gun that he built for Buzzy that was really a good board. It was way ahead of its time. And this was back in the early 50s, mid 50s. So Joe was really making good boards. We had the fiberglass then, we had the balsa fiberglass and the foam fiberglass. So, uh, Joe made really good boards, uh, and uh, Matt Kivlin made some good boards too. He didn't make; he wasn't over here riding winter surf, but he made some good boards on the on the mainland. He, uh, I think Joe and Matt started the Malibu chipboard. Simmons was a big influence too, uh, but yeah, Joe was a classic. He he. Uh, he was a, a real space case, you know. He, he I'll never forget this. <laughs> we're, we're at the airport, Honolulu Airport, and Aggie and Aggie's mother, Aggie is, is uh, uh, Joe's wife, and I grew up with Don Bain, Aggie's older brother, and he went to grammar school and junior high and high school with me. So, and I knew the, his mom, and his mom and Aggie are there in the airport, and they're saying, where's Joe? And Joe was walking around the airport trying to find his car. He didn't remember where he parked his car. They were there about an hour looking for the car in the, the different parking lots, you know. Joe was that type of guy. When I did work construction with Joe, uh, Kevin Grant is a real good friend of mine. We, were, we would drive in with Joe. I, I'd drive over with Joe, and we'd work. This was during... Easter vacation and summer times and stuff. And I remember we went and stopped to get gas. The guy, in those days, you didn't fill up your own gas. You always had service. And the guy came and he, he serviced the car and g gave him the gas and everything else. And, and Joe was so busy talking. He was talking to, to Kevin and me and he was just talking about all this stuff. And once he gets talking, he's in another world. And then he says, why aren't these guys going to get the gas? What's happening? And he's starting to scream at the guy, when are you going to do my... And the guy looked at him like... <laughs> so Joe was classic. We know how you feel about the leash, Peter. Um, and um, like we were talking about, Eddie came and it went. You were part of a generation that many firsts are attributed to in the sport of big wave riding. There was no jet skis, no inflatable vests, no lifeguards at bay, and no leashes. Once you paddled out to the lineup, you had to get yourself back in. I read this year that there were two surfers in the eddy who refused to wear an inflatable vest, one even being quoted as saying, if you have to wear one, you don't belong out there. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, is that, uh, was that a... Uh... Uh, Keone Downing? I believe it was Sonny Garcia. Sonny Garcia, okay. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think, uh, I, I don't understand why anybody needs a leash or an or a inflated, uh, you know, the wipeouts aren't that bad. You're, uh, I, I really, uh, 
but I think Jaws might be a different story. I can see where maybe they need to have some extra things for the Jaws because that's a, a much... Well, first of all, it gets bigger there. It's rideable at a bigger size than you get at Waimea. If Waimea got to the size that you get at Jaws, it would be closed out. So uh, uh, I think maybe they need a, the oxygen and things for Cortez, out the Cortez Bank and, you know, where these guys are charging. They might need all that stuff. But for Waimea, I don't think it's necessary. Uh, Is there a rush when you ride a big wave? Oh, yeah. It's... The, bit, the, the hardest part about riding big waves is the takeoff. Once you're down on the bottom, it's a breeze. But it's that, it's that adrenaline rush to get yourself, when that wave comes, it's to get yourself into the wave. And you, to ride it right, to ride any big wave right, you have to be, you can't be on the peak. You have to be a little bit on the inside of that peak, uh, like at YMA, you have to be on this side, the Kuhuku side of the peak. Uh, and then you, you can come into the wave, and you have to take off when it's really steep, and, and you, you've got to paddle in and get down into the wave. And if you try to take off on the ledge or on the peak, your board gets held up, and you can't get down as easily as you can if you're over further to the, the inside. So the guys that really ride YMA well, John John Florence and, and, the, and uh, Jamie Mitchell, the guys that were really riding that place the way it should be ridden that day were all over, uh, Ross Clark Jones, they were all over on that that's, uh, north side of that peak, and they were taking off and coming across. And the guys that were having trouble were taking off in the peak and getting stuck at the top and going over the falls. So the rush is, is to, when you see the wave, is just to start paddling and going for it and not, not thinking about it and not being intimidated and just go for it and then get down into the wave and then go for the angle and slide. And, uh, so uh, to me, the, the, the waves that I remember, the ones that were so big uh, that I didn't go for it, you know, I chickened out. And uh, like George says, the waves you remember are not the waves you rode, the waves you didn't ride, you know. And uh, sometimes a wave is so big, got so much water, and there's so much water particles coming up the face, when you start to go for it, it's, it's just too much, so you back off. And uh, every once in a while, if you sort of, are, if you're lucky and you're right in the right spot, you might take off and go for those waves, but there's a limit to what a what a human being, a psych, the mental psych you can you can do. You know the amount of wave and water that you can ride into. Ever have a wipeout that you thought you were going to die? Oh no, never. Not even the worst situation I had was when I punctured my ear at sunset. I took off on a wave and I fell flat on my ear and I got vertical. And I was in the sunset lineup and when I'd come up, the horizon would be going around. I got vertical and, and I was all dizzy, you know, and everything was all, because I had water in the, I punctured my ear and I had water in the eardrum and I was just totally uh, nauseous and, and <coughs> going totally out, out to, really out to lunch and I was in the in a in the lineup at sunset having to dive under waves and coming up and that that situation was kind of uncomfortable uh, because uh, of the of the vertical and then I've had a I've maybe had four or five two wave hold downs at Waimea that where you come up you're happy you're up in the air you know you're happy you got out but uh, never not even close to drowning I know you're always following and watching and interested in surfing. I mean, it's so much a part of your life. Who interests you today as a surfer? Oh, I really like uh, I really like John John uh, and, and Kelly Slater. Uh, the the, th the the thing I like about them is they, they when when they you know when they interview them they're very articulate, they're intelligent. And they're nice, you know, and they're uh, they're really good surfers, but they're not 
you, you don't see, if you're out in the lineup for John John, you don't see him snaking people. Uh, you don't see him uh, trying to hog every wave, you know. The, the guy's a real gentleman, and he's just an unbelievably good surfer. So, and Ross Clark Jones is a real classic big wave rider. Uh, uh, I think uh, Derek Dorner, Ken Bradshaw, he, he charges. Um, th there were a lot of guys that rode big waves that had a lot of, I really had high respect for. Uh, Kimo Hollinger was a real charger in his day. And Pat Curran, gosh, I have the greatest respect. And Greg Noel. Um, one day, uh, the, probably the biggest wave I ever saw Greg ride, I did, he didn't actually ride it, he just got wiped out, but there was, uh, he had just gotten off the airplane. He came out, and Waimea was as big as it can get and be rideable. And he, he saw us get a few waves, and he got all charged up, and he went paddling out, and he sat way outside, and, and when a big set comes, he starts hyperventilating, you know, he's going, ah, ah, ah. And he's hyperventilating away, you know, and, and it just, it psychs everybody out, you know. This guy out there, this madman out there is hyperventilating. And then he took off on this wave, and it was just, it just was a disaster. I mean, there was no way he was going to get further down than about a third of the way down. But he had his eyes shut. He, he, I swore, I paddled right by him, and his eyes were shut, you know. So... I said, I, I, I asked him, he said, how come you, he said, well, if I had my eyes open, I wouldn't have gone for it. You know? <laughs> but he just took off, and it was one of the biggest waves I've ever seen anybody take off on. And it just, he had, you know, he had just arrived, and he had to get the, he, you know, he, his ego, he had to get the biggest wave. And he just took off, and it, it slide slipped, he went over the falls. I think he had a two-wave hold down, he practically almost drowned, and his, his when he came up, his he was real pale. Yeah. Uh, it was classic. But he had his eyes shut, so I think that helps. Mm -hmm.